Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Srikant, Associate Professor, VIT University, Chennai Campus. I would like to take a small class on the topic called pure substance. Pure substance, the meaning, the literal meaning of pure substance in itself uh, means uh, that it is not mixed with any other substance uh, purely, it means everything by itself. But technically, there are some elaborate meanings, uh, there, are, there is some elaborate explanation for the substance. For example, take the example of uh, water. Water can exist in three different forms, ice uh, in solid form, water in the liquid form, and steam in the gaseous form. All these three, even though the places are different, they are still considered to be a pure substance. So, this is the technical meaning of uh, the word pure substance. The application of pure substance is uh, in several places, but most importantly in the, uh, in the area of uh, uh, steam power plants. We use steam in uh, steam power plants, that's the working fluid, the steam power plants and the steam is in two forms, uh, water and water vapor. Similarly, in the case of refrigeration and air conditioning, we have the refrigerant which changes phase. It's, uh, some places it is in the liquid phase and some places it is in the vapor phase. So, these are the places where we apply the concept of uh, pure substances. You will be taught how to uh, define certain properties of pure substances and how to see, how to uh, see, the use the pro steam tables and uh, refrigeration tables and so on. Now, let us go to the slide number 166, that is uh, pure substance. The definition, a substance that has a fixed chemical composition throughout is called a pure substance. This is important, it needs to have a fixed chemical composition. For example, take water, even though in the form of ice, water, liquid water and water vapor, the chemical formula is still H2O, that means that is a pure substance. A pure substance does not have to be of a single chemical element or compound. Now, this is again important, it does not have to be of a single chemical element or compound. For example, water is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, it, has, it is two different elements. Similarly, a mixture of various chemical elements or compounds is a pure substance as long as the mixture is homogeneous. Example, air. In the case of air, air is a mixture basically of uh, oxygen and nitrogen and there are uh, water vapor is another uh, con constituent of air. As long as the mixture is homogeneous throughout, we call this as a pure substance. A mixture of oil and water is not a pure substance as oil is not soluble in water. This is important, the miscibility is important, so they should be uh, very well uh, mixed together and oil and water, oil will uh, suspend on top of water, it will not mix because of the density difference and therefore the mixture of oil and water can never be a pure substance. A pure substance. Uh, continuation, a mixture of two or more phases of a pure substance is still a pure substance as long as the chemical composition of all phases is the same. Example, a mixture of ice and water. So, ice and water mixture, ice floating on water, that is still a pure substance because the chemical formula is still H2O. A mixture of liquid air and gaseous air is not a pure substance as the compositions are different. Liquid air and gaseous air, remember that air is a compose is a constituent of uh, uh, sorry air is a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen which condense at two different temperatures so, therefore if we are talking about liquid air we don't have the li uh, liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen at the same state and therefore it is not a pure substance phases of a pure substance a phase is ident identified as having a distinct molecular arrangement that is homogeneous throughout and separated from the others by easily identifiable boundary surface, for example, iced water. So, as the definition says, the, by ident the boundaries should be easily identifiable. In the case of uh, mixture of ice and water, we can easily identify the solid boundaries from the liquid boundaries. Substances are present in three phases, solid, liquid and gas. This is basic physics. We have the other of this. Okay. <coughs> the molecules in a solid are arranged in a three-dimensional pattern. Due to the small distances between the molecules in solids, the attractive forces of molecules on each other are large and keep the molecules in fixed position. In, the, in case of solids, the 
attractive forces are large and therefore the distances are small and the molecules are uh, intact and don't move uh, from their fixed position. The molecular spacing in the liquid phase is similar to that solid except that the molecules are no longer at fixed position related to each other and can rotate and translate freely. In case of the liquid phase, there is a little amount of uh, uh, freedom to move and therefore the, uh, the property of liquid. <coughs> but in the case of gaseous phase, the molecules are far apart from each other and molecular order is non-existent. In case of uh, gaseous phase, the molecules are quite apart from each other and therefore the movement is uh, quite uh, fast. Gas molecules move about random, continually colliding with each other and the walls of the container. So the movement of the gaseous molecules is uh, very, very high and if they are in a container, they will be hitting the walls of the container, which will be manifested in the form of pressure. Molecules in the gas phase are at considerably higher energy level than they are in the liquid and solid phases. Uh, as this point says, the energy levels in gaseous uh, uh, form is uh, very, very high. That is because of the random movement that is facilitated by the freedom to move, the degree of freedom available for the molecules. Now coming to the phase change process. Phase change process is basically dealing with the change of one phase to the other phase. For example, changing of uh, liquid phase to solid phase is called solidification. Uh, solid phase to liquid phase is called melting, solid phase to gaseous phase is called sublimation. Phase change processes take place in practical situations. Water exists as liquid and vapor in a boiler and a condenser. In a boiler, water is uh, converted from liquid water to water vapor. But during the process, there will be both mixture of uh, liquid water as well as water vapor. Therefore, boiler deals with the liquid phase as well as the gaseous phase. And in a condenser, the vapor is condensed to liquid water and therefore a condenser is a device which hands both liquid water and water vapor. Similarly, the refrigerant turns from liquid to vapor in a refrigerator. In a refrigerator, the cooling effect is provided by the evaporation of the refrigerant. The, the refrigerant evaporates from liquid state to gaseous state and the heat required for the evaporation is uh, drawn from the area that is to be cooled. Here, water is used to explain the process, but the principles are equally applicable to other pure substances. Since you are more familiar with water, I will be talking more about the phases of water and treating water as the pure substance, uh, what are the different properties of water and uh, so on. But remember that all the principles that are being discussed and uh, that are applicable for water are equally applicable to uh, any other pure substance, for example, refrigerants. The properties, how they behave, how they change, they are all similar except that their magnitudes may be different. For example, water may boil at 100 degrees uh, uh, temperature at one atmosphere pressure. That is a fixed value for water. Similarly, a refrigerant will have a fixed value. It may not be 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere pressure, it may be something else. But the changing pattern, uh, for example, if we increase the pressure, water's boiling point increases. Similarly, if we increase the pressure of a refrigerant, its boiling point increases. Therefore, this, this uh, pattern is similar to all pure substances and we will be focusing more on water, but whatever is discussed for water is equally applicable to other pure substances. Now look at this picture. There are five uh, different experimental setups, we have different states from state 1 to state 5. Now what do we have? Look at the state 1, the first picture on the left top, there is a vessel, there is a, it's a container and it contains liquid water at uh, 20 degrees Celsius and pressure of 1 atmosphere. The top of this vessel is closed with the help of a freely movable frictionless piston and the weight on the piston is made such that the uh, the pressure is one atmosphere. Now remember that this piston is freely movable frictionless piston and therefore if there is any tendency to pressure increase inside the water then that forces will move the piston upwards and therefore the pressure will not exceed one atmosphere it will still be equal to one atmosphere. Now let us do this thought experiment. 
take this vessel, put some water in it at 20 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, maintain the pressure on top and cover it with the frictionless piston. Now heat it from the bottom. What happens? The temperature of the water will increase and if you see in the state 2, the temperature now has reached 100 degrees Celsius. What is the state? At state 1, it is uh, uh, water. At state 2, the phase is still water, but the water is at 100 degrees Celsius. Liquid phases at state 1 and state 2. Come to state 3 after further heating. Now, that what happened? The temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, but now you can see that there is some amount of water vapor that has accumulated on top of this liquid water. You can see that is what we call it saturated vapor and saturated liquid. I will explain the, the meaning of the saturated word later on. Now, if you see from the state 1 and state 2, the phases are liquid. Is there any increase in volume from state 1 to state 2? It is very, very little. But the volume increase from state 2 to state 3 is uh, quite high because now the phase change process started taking place and the water vapor that is formed which is very, very less dense and therefore it occupies a lot of space and therefore there is a rise in volume. What is the pressure? It is still one atmosphere. Why? Because we are using a frictionless piston which will push the piston upwards to accommodate the increase in volume. If the piston is fixed, there cannot be any increase in volume and therefore there will be a tendency to increase the pressure. But that is not possible here because we have not fixed the piston. Now come to state 4 by continuously heating from state 3. Now we do not see any water left, everything is steam but it is at 100 degrees Celsius. That means water has become water vapor or steam at 100 degrees Celsius at a pressure of 1 atmosphere. We know that one at one atmosphere water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This temperature is called the saturation temperature of water at one atmosphere. In the in the parlance of uh, pure substances, we won't use the word boiling point. We use the saturation temperature. So I can put this in a statement. At a pressure of one atmosphere, the saturation temperature of water is 100 degrees Celsius. Vice versa, at 100 degrees Celsius, the saturation pressure of water is one atmosphere. This is the way we talk in the, uh, in the field of pure substances. Now, let us go to state 1. The temperature is 300 degrees Celsius. Now, what happened? We have continue, continued heating. So, steam at 100 degrees Celsius absorbed heat, increased its temperature and came to 300 degrees Celsius. But remember, still the temperature, the pressure is for atmosphere and the volume is quite large. So, the volume of steam, steam is very, very less dense and therefore, the volume of price is very, very high. Now, let us uh, observe certain uh, points here. The volume has uh, increased, the pressure has remained, the temperature has changed in certain places and has not changed in certain places. For example, from state 1 to state 2, the temperature has changed from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. From state 2 to state 4, the temperature remained constant at 100 degrees Celsius. Now, we have come, we have been heating from state 2 to state 4, but the temperature has not changed. What does it mean? What is happening to the heat that we have been supplying? The heat that we have been supplying is utilized to change the phase. And therefore, from state 2 to state 4, all the heat we have supplied has been consumed to change the phase and none is utilized for increasing the temperature. But again from state 4 to state 5, once the ch phase change process has completed, from state 4 to state 5, the temperature started increasing again and it has reached 300 degrees Celsius. So, this temperature change from state 1 to state 2 sim and similarly from state 4 to state 5, this process is called sensible heating. because Whatever heat that we are supplying is sensed by a thermometer, while in the case of processes from state 2 to state 3 and state 3 to state 4, whatever heat we have supplied is not suggested, is not measured by a thermometer because the temperature remains constant and we can only see that in the form of a change in phase. Therefore, this temperature, this, uh, this process are called uh, the process from 
state 2 to state 3 and state 3 to state 4 they are called latent heat process whatever heat we are supplying is hidden in the in the matter and it is being used in the form of uh, energy that is required for causing the phase change and not to cause the temperature change now as you can see there is a legend presented in this uh, slide state 1 is called compressed liquid state 2 is called saturated liquid state 3 is called saturated liquid plus saturated vapor we also call it as a mixed phase state 4 is saturated vapor and state 5 is superheated vapor state 1 is compressed liquid that means the liquid is having a volume much less than the volume at that uh, at that uh, pressure state 2 is called saturated liquid because it is uh, a point which is on the verge of uh, becoming vapor it's not vapor yet but a little amount of vapor heat little amount of heat that you supply will start converting this liquid to vapor so it's on the verge it is uh, in the it's tending to become vapor and therefore we call it as a saturated liquid state 3 is a saturated liquid plus saturated vapor which means that it is a mixture of liquid and vapor but still it is at 100 degrees Celsius and we still call it a saturated liquid and saturated vapor Sa state 4 is called saturated vapor again the name saturated is because it is on the verge of condensation for example at state 4 which is saturated vapor if we remove little amount of heat water starts from it, condensation starts so that means it is on the verge of condensation which we call it as a saturated vapor and state 5 is called superheated vapor it is we call it superheated vapor because the temperature at state 5 is higher than the saturation temperature remember throughout this process from state 1 to state 5 the pressure has been one atmosphere and for one atmosphere pressure the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius actually we should say the saturation temperature at, at a pressure of one atmosphere the saturation temperature is 100 degrees Celsius and since at state 5 the temperature is greater than 100 degrees Celsius we call it as a superheated vapor so in a superheated state the temperature of the vapor will be higher than the saturated vapor now there is another name for the water at state 1 remember the saturation temperature at one atmosphere is 100 degrees celsius and the st at state 1 the temperature is 20 degrees celsius that means it is cooler at state 1 it is cooler than the saturation temperature this state as you see in the slide it is called compressed liquid it is also called subcooled liquid it makes a sense at state 5 we are calling superheated that means something which is hotter than the saturation temperature and at state 1 it is cooler than the saturation temperature so we call it as subcooled so less than the saturation temperature subcooled greater than saturation temperature superheated remember that now we have some definitions compressed or subcooled liquid means that it is not about to vaporize at this point at this uh, subcooled uh, or compressed uh, liquid a little addition of wa of heat does not convert the phase and therefore it is not about to vaporize saturated liquid is a liquid that is about to vaporize saturated vapor is a vapor that is about to condense that means if you are, are able to remove a little amount of heat saturated vapor will start condensation saturated liquid vapor mixture is a condition where liquid and vapor coexist in equilibrium and superheated vapor is a vapor that is not about to condense so the definition for saturated liquid and vapor are similar the definition for subcooled liquid and superheated vapor also are similar now in this slide you can see the experiments that we have done from state 1 to state 5 are marked on two axes the y axis is the temperature axis in celsius and the x axis is the specific volume temperature we have seen that it increases from uh, it increases in certain uh, processes and it remains constant in certain processes volume keeps increasing throughout but in the liquid phase the amount of increase is very very less and in the vapor phase it is very very high that is represented in this particular graph if you look at uh, 
point 1 it is one atmosphere and at 20 degrees celsius and uh, at state 2 which is the saturated liquid wave liquid the amount of increase in the specific volume is very very less but the amount of temperature rise is high 100 degrees celsius but from state 2 to state 3 and state 3 to state 4 the temperature has remained constant but the volume has increased tremendously and remember this line that you see is fully a one atmosphere line this so this graph is for one atmosphere pressure at state 4 all the liquid water has converted to water vapor at state 3 there is a mixture of liquid water and water vapor at state 2 everything is liquid water but at saturation temperature of 100 degrees celsius at state 4 if we continue to heat we will be heating and there will be sensible heat and therefore there is a rise in temperature and the point 5 will be reached where the temperature is 300 degrees celsius we call this as a superheated vapor now if we repeat the same experiment except for one change let us increase the pressure let us say one atmosphere is now increased to two atmospheres how can we increase that put some weights on the piston and the pressure will increase so if we do that we will have a similar line on top of what we have we will have all the states one two three four five but at a magnitude greater than what we see in this particular figure similarly if we keep increasing we will get similar lines at a higher high, higher and higher so as you increase the pressure we get similar lines which are going towards the top so if we join all the points st uh, state point 2 and all the state point 4 you will get a kind of a dome which we shall see later saturation temperature which is uh, T sat is the temperature at which a pure substance changes phase that is what we call as a boiling point but here we will use the word saturation temperature saturation pressure is the pressure at which a pure substance changes phase latent heat of vaporization is the amount of heat absorbed during evaporation this is the amount of heat that is utilized in change of phase from liquid to vapor now this is the uh, <coughs> saturation pressure versus saturation temperature curve you can see that as the saturation temperature increases the saturation pressure increases that means the p sat is a function of p sat for example if we we have done this experiment at one atmosphere pressure and we have seen that the saturation temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. that is common knowledge now what will happen if we increase the pressure to two atmospheres now you will notice that the saturation temperature will be 120 degrees celsius that is the reason why it is used it is usually easy to cook foods in a pressure cooker rather than in an open vessel open vessel is exposed to atmospheric pressure and therefore the temperature will not exceed as far as the boiling is con continued the temperature will not exceed 100 degrees celsius but in a pressure cooker the design is made in such a way that the pressure is like two to two and a half atmospheres and therefore the temperatures reached in a pressure cooker are like 120 125 degrees celsius and therefore certain foods which are difficult to cook in open vessels are easily cooked and quickly cooked in a pressure cooker in a pressure cooker since the temperature pressure reaches this two and a half atmospheres the temperatures are 120 degrees celsius so this principle is used for pressure cooker similarly if we go to a heat station at an elevated altitude the pressures drop and therefore the boiling point also drops something less than 100 degrees Celsius and therefore the, the foods which are easily cooked at one atmosphere will now be difficult to cook because uh, because of the lower pressures we will not be able to attain the temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Now this is a temperature specific volume uh, graph as I told you this are several lines uh, this is at one atmosphere let's say this is at <coughs> one atmosphere pressure this is at two atmospheres three atmospheres uh, uh, and so on as you go up the pressures are increasing and you see that the pattern of these lines are all similar we got this kind of lines uh, earlier in this figure in in this figure of slide 174 and the same pattern we see here but for different pressures and you can see that the 
points these points are called saturated liquids these points are called saturated and if we join these points and if we join these points you get a kind of a dome a dome to its to the left side of the dome we have subcooled liquid and inside the dome we have mixed phase and to the right side of the dome we have superheated liquid now here you see there is a point called critical point the values of temperature and pressure at this critical point are 373.95 degrees celsius and 22.06 megapascals or approximately 22 megapascals or 220 bar now at this pressure this and temperature we call that it's a critical point what is the significance of critical point remember that if we join this points saturated liquid points and the saturated vapor points so we will have a dome and this critical point will be the topmost point on that particular dome after this there is no difference between a liquid phase and vapor phase that means if we pressurize water to 22 mega pascals and supply heat then with a little amount of heat the liquid will immediately flash into vapor without any intermediate liquid vapor mixed region so that is the significance of critical point and therefore there is no latent heat involved uh, at temperature at points at conditions above the critical point the critical point is defined as the point at which the saturated liquid and saturated vapor states are identical they are identical that means there is no difference between liquid and vapor phase for water the critical pressure is 22.06 mega pascals and the critical temperature is 373.95 degrees celsius usually we call it as a 220 bar and 374 degrees celsius approximately now this is the dome that i was talking about on a temperature versus specific volume graph we have this dome in this dome inside the dome we call this region as the saturated liquid vapor region where there is a mixture present mixture of solid uh, mixture of solid, uh, liquid and vapor and the left side of the dome this is called the saturated liquid line and the right side of the dome is called the saturated vapor line and to the left the region to the left of the dome we call this as a compressed liquid or subcooled liquid where the temperatures are less than the saturation temperatures at that particular pressure similarly to the right side of the dome we have the superheated vapor region which is uh, the region where the temperatures are greater than the saturated temperatures and we can also see the critical point now you can see the distances from this point to this point the amount of energy that is needed to convert liquid water to water vapor at that particular pressure is a given value and if you proceed upwards you see that the distance between these two points is reducing if you go up this is much less much less much less and at the critical point the distance is zero that means there is actually no difference between saturated liquid and saturated vapor at that point and there is no latent heat of vaporization involved at that particular point now certain definitions we use for this in a liquid vapor mixture this definition is applicable we know that the liquid vapor mixture is present inside the dome in in this region and in this region we know that to the left we have very little vapor and mostly liquid and to the right we have mostly vapor and very very little liquid so how do we quantify these two quantities amount of vapor and amount of liquid these quantities are related by a word called quality it's also called as a dryness fraction and how is it defined it's simple it's the symbol is x and it's defined as the mass of vapor divided by the total mass that means mass of the vapor divided by the mass of the liquid plus mass of vapor so this is basically the definition now if we apply this dryness fraction definition to saturated liquid line at this point if we want to apply uh, what is the dryness fraction here uh, going by the definition 
it is the dryness fraction is mass of vapor divided by the mass of the total mixture in the numerator we have mass of vapor as zero at this saturated liquid line and therefore here the dryness fraction will be zero if we go to the center we will have equal amounts of water and equal amounts of water vapor and therefore the dryness fraction will be will be 0 0.5 and at this point on the saturated vapor line everything is vapor there is no liquid and therefore in the numerator and the denominator we have mass of vapor and mass of vapor and that makes the dryness fraction equal to 1 so remember at on the saturated liquid line the dryness fraction is 0 and on the saturated vapor line the dryness fraction is 1 and in between the value will be anywhere between 0 and 1 now how do we relate the various properties using the dryness fraction for example what is what are these equations mean let us take the first equation v is the specific volume remember see this is not capital v this is italicized v this is specific volume x is the dryness fraction f the subscript f is meant for fluid or in this case liquid and the subscript g here is meant for gaseous phase which in this case is uh, vapor here this f and g are the general subscripts so that we can use the same equation for any fluids not just water or steam we can also use this for refrigerants now the specific volume at a given condition in between the saturated liquid and saturated vapor are given by this equation 1 minus x multiplied by vf vf is the specific volume on the saturated liquid line and a vg is the specific volume on the saturated gaseous line so if we know the dryness fraction if we know vf and vg from the property tables then we can calculate the specific volume of a particular steam at a given condition similarly we can calculate the internal energy u is the internal energy similarly h is the enthalpy s is the entropy we can calculate these properties using the dryness fractions and the property values at saturated liquid and saturated vapor line which are available from the steam tables remember what is the importance of these uh, steam tables unfortunately as far as steam is uh, concerned we cannot calculate these properties easily using simple equations if we are dealing with gases if you are dealing with air or uh, pure uh, ideal gases then we have the ideal gas equation using which you can calculate some properties but such ease is absent in case of uh, water and refrigerants and therefore we have to use complicated equations and using the complicated equations it is difficult to remember it is difficult to calculate and therefore these property tables have been pre-calculated and printed for our easy usage so all these equations are summarized and generalized in the form y is any property like one of these properties that is equal to 1 minus x multiplied by a the property value on the saturated liquid line plus x multiplied with the property value on the saturated vapor line. Now, characteristics of superheated vapor. Compared to saturated vapor, superheated vapor is characterized by low pressures. The pressure at a saturated is less than <coughs> the saturated pressure at a given temperature. Similarly, higher temperature, the temperature is at a superheated state is greater than the saturation temperature at a given pressure. Higher specific volume. The specific volume will be higher. The volume of the will be higher. Higher internal energy. Remember, internal energy is purely a function of temperature. So, the temperature is high, the, the internal energy will be high. Higher enthalpy. Enthalpy is again a sum of internal energy plus some other quantity, and therefore the enthalpy is also will be high for a given pressure and temperature. Characteristics of a compressed liquid. A compressed liquid is characterized by higher pressures at a given uh, temperature and lower temperatures at a given pressure, lower specific volumes lower internal energies and lower enthalpy. So, these things are understandable from what we have seen from the superheated properties. However, the properties of compressed liquid are not much different from the corresponding saturated liquid values. What is this last point saying? It says that the property values that means the specific volumes, enthalpies, entropies, internal energies and so on are not greatly different from the corresponding saturation liquid values. I will explain that by going to going back to one of the figures that we have seen earlier now take this line take this line at p1 that point says that the property values at this 
point and at this point they are not much different. That means if I want to find the internal energy at this point, I can very well use the internal energy at this point and go ahead with the calculations without involving much error. Similarly, the enthalpies, entropies and specific volumes. Okay, these are some problems we can uh, solve later, but one important point that you need to understand is that to know all the properties of a given, uh, a, of a given steam, you need to specify two independent properties. So if you are given two independent properties, you will be able to tell the rest of the properties. But remember, the properties given should be independent properties, that is of utmost importance. As long as the properties are independent, you can use those two properties and go ahead with estimating all the other properties. Now, <coughs> I will be showing you shortly what is, uh, how to use the steam table. But, for it, but before we go that, I want to emphasize more on this uh, independency of these two properties. For example, at one atmosphere pressure, I will say I have steam at one atmosphere pressure and its steam temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. What is the specific volume? Now, this question is asking the property value specific volume by giving two properties. Remember the condition, the two properties must be independent. Now, come to one of these uh, pictures. Let us say that this is one atmosphere pressure line. So one atmosphere pressure and that temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Now the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius here on atmosphere pressure. Temperature is one atmosphere, uh, 100 degrees Celsius on atmosphere here. Here also, here also pressure and temperature are one, one atmosphere and 100 degrees Celsius. One atmosphere 100 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere 100 degrees Celsius. That means uh, that same two properties can exist at different specific volumes. At, at this point the specific volume is different, at this point the specific volume is greatly different. And therefore, these two properties in this particular problem are not independent. So for example, if I say 100 degrees Celsius, then I should, I should say something else apart from the pressure because 100 degrees Celsius will automatically fix the pressure as one atmosphere or vice versa. If I say one at one atmosphere pressure, then the saturation temperature is automatically 100 degrees Celsius. It cannot be anything else for water. So if I want a property value at one atmosphere pressure, I should give some other value except temperature because temperature and pressure are not independent. They are dependent on each other. So that's the importance of this property independence. Now in this problem, if you see, there is a table. Let us, uh, there, are, there are basically four columns in this table, four different property values. The first one is the temperature, second one is the pressure, third one is the specific volume, and fourth one is the phase description, whether it is in the compressed liquid or the saturated vapor or superheated, uh, superheated vapor. Now, this, these are basically four properties and if you see the temperature on the, uh, if you see each problem, each problem are, is a different one. So in the first problem, temperature is given, specific volume is given, you are asked to find what is the pressure and you are asked to tell what is the phase description. In the second problem, you are given the pressure, you are given the phase description, you have to find what is the specific volume and what is the temperature. In the third one, you are given the temperature, you are given the pressure, you will have to find out what is the specific volume and what is the phase description. In the fourth one also, you are given two properties, you have to find the other two properties. Remember that the two property rule, two independent property rule, in all these problems, you are given two properties. Once you are given two independent properties, automatically you can fix that state and find out the properties of other, uh, other property magnitudes of other properties. That is the importance of this. So in any problem on steam tables, you need at least two independent properties to start proceeding to solve the problem. Now let us go to steam tables and I will teach you how to uh, 
look at steam tables and properties. Steam tables are basically tables in which the steam properties are listed. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the equations involved in calculating these property values are quite complex and therefore we are not given that burden of calculation, we are given the property values directly by pre-calculated uh, method. So all the numbers that you see in this uh, table are pre-calculated. Now, again going back to the presentation, see that there are three regions in the vapor dome. On the temperature specific volume uh, graph, we see this vapor dome and on the left side of the vapor dome, we have a compressed liquid region. On the middle of the vapor dome, we have the saturated liquid vapor region, which we also call as the mixed region. And on the right side, we have a superheated vapor region. Three different regions. Three different regions, they have three different tables. So there is one table for compressed liquid region, there is one table for saturated liquid vapor region and there is one table for superheated vapor region. Now there is a similarity between superheated vapor region and compressed liquid vapor region. Now what is that? Let me tell you by first going to the saturated vapor region. In the saturated vapor region, look at this P1, with let us say it is 100 degree, 100 uh, sorry, P1 is 1 atmosphere pressure. At one atmosphere pressure, the saturation temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, which we already know. That means at this point, if the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, here is 100, here it is 100. That means pressure and temperature in the mixed region, they are not independent, they are dependent. Now let us come to the subcooled region here. Here the pressure is one atmosphere, but here the temperature is uh, close to 100, here the temperature is uh, much less close to 100 it is much at this point it is much far away from 100 much much far away from 100 similarly that means at on the compressed liquid region the temperature and pressure are in, are independent similarly on the superheated vapor region side that pressure uh, for one, one atmosphere pressure the temperature is here is uh, let us say 110 degrees here it is 120 here it is 130 here it is 150 it goes on increasing again that means that in the superheated region the temperature and pressure are again independent so this pressure and temperature independency is present in the compressed liquid region and in the superheated vapor region and therefore this point is utilized and some steam tables I remember some not all some steam tables tend to combine the property values of compressed liquid region and superheated vapor region and present in the same table. So, if you take any typical steam table, you will have three different tables, one for the compressed liquid region, one for the saturated liquid vapor region and one for the superheated vapor region, but few tables will have only two different tables, one for the saturated liquid vapor region and one for compressed liquid as well as the superheated vapor region. So, let us see what we have here. This is called the steam table properties of saturated water in the liquid vapor region that means this is for the mixed region that is the region inside the dome this is the continuation <coughs> and then we go further we have saturated water uh, liquid vapor region but this is called the pressure table now earlier table was called the temperature table what is this difference if you see that this is the properties of saturated water, liquid vapor, temperature table. The next one, properties of saturated liquid vapor, pressure table. That means, when we say it is pressure table, that means the first column is pressure. Similarly, if we, when we say it is the temperature table, the first column is temperature, the second column is pressure and vice versa. So, this table A2 and A3 are saturation liquid vapor properties, one is the temperature table and other one is the pressure table. Now coming to the table A4, we have properties of superheated vapor. So we know that in the superheated region, the temperature and pressure can be independent and therefore if you see the first property we have for the pressure of 0 0.06 bar, the property values at different temperatures. Similarly, the second block of table at pressure of 0 0.35 bar, we have uh, property values at again the different temperatures. So this is the superheated table. 
we have for different pressures up to 10 mega pascals that is 100 bar and more what is coming so you see here 240 bar or 24 mega pascals very high pressures 32 mega pascals and the last table table j5 is for compressed liquid see the way in which compressed liquid table and fluidity table the design is similar but the liquid saturated table the design is slightly different that is because of the temperature pressure independency in case of compressed liquid water and uh, superheated tables. Here also for a given pressure we have the properties listed at different temperatures. So here we have pressure of 25 bar and for different temperatures of 20 to 220 degrees Celsius we have different values of uh, property. Similarly at a pressure of 50 bar we have different property values for these temperatures ranges. So this is the uh, subcooled liquid region okay now let us go to the first uh, page of the table saturated liquid water vapor temperature table first column is the temperature second column is the pressure and uh, next column is the specific volume and in the specific volume you can see that there is value of vf vf is the specific volume in the saturated liquid line vg is the specific volume on the saturated vapor line Similarly, UF is the specific volume of the saturated liquid line, specific volume of the saturated vapor line. Enthalpy, HF is the enthalpy of the specific volume, uh, sorry, enthalpy of, uh, on the saturated liquid line. HFG, we will come to that later. HG is the enthalpy on the saturated vapor line. What is this HFG? HFG is the difference between HG and HF. So 2501.4 minus 0 0.01 will be 2501.3. Now this difference, we, this table, particular table has uh, given it because in many cases uh, involving calculations in Rankine cycle, we will be dealing with the difference HF, which is basically the enthalpy of evaporation, evaporation. So this difference will be using it, and therefore so we don't so as to enable us not to calculate it every time this HFG value is tabulated but some tables will not give this value of HFG and in that case you will have to calculate yourself the difference between HG and HF. Similarly the last column is entropy, SF is the entropy of the saturated liquid and SG is the entropy of the saturated vapor. Now this table continues to the next page also and if you see the last entry in this table you see 374.14 degrees Celsius and 220.9. Do you realize, recognize these numbers? These numbers are basically the critical temperature and critical pressure values. Now let us go to the next table. This is saturated water liquid vapor pressure table. This is exactly similar to the temperature table except the pressure in the pressure table, the first column will be the pressure. Second column is the corresponding saturation temperature. And we have the specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy and entropy same as uh, given in the temperature table. Why these two different tables, why temperature table and pressure table? In some problems we may have temperature available and pressure is not available, in which case we should look in the temperature table. In some cases we will have the pressure and then we will have to go to the pressure table. So to facilitate this we have two different tables but uh, remember that the property values given in the temperature table and pressure table are exactly one and the same. Another important point, at one bar, which is approximately one atmosphere, what is the boiling point? We are aware that the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, but here from the tables you can see that at one bar pressure, at this value, the boiling point is 99.63 degrees Celsius. So at exactly one atmosphere, which is 1.01 bar, the temperature will be 100 degrees Celsius, which we can see from the temperature table. So if you go to 100 degrees Celsius, you can see that the saturation pressure is 1.01 bar. So suppose I want to design a pressure cooker which can boil at 150 degrees Celsius. What should I do? Let us go to the temperature table, look at 150 degrees Celsius and look at the corresponding pressure, 4.758 bar. So I should design a pressure vessel, which is basically pressure cooker in our case, which can withstand this 4.758 bar pressure. So if that can withstand, then I will have boiling taking place at 150 degrees Celsius. Therefore, 
it is extremely easy to cook in such a pressure cooker. But remember 4.758 is quite high. We have accidents taking place at uh, two, at two, two and a half bar pressure system. So it's uh, not uh, advisable and uh, not necessary to go to uh, 4.758 bar, especially for pressure cooker. We are happy with whatever we have as on date. So that's the pressure table and the temperature table over. Now here also at the end of the pressure table you see that there are the last entry is 229 bar and 374.1 degrees Celsius which is basically again the critical point. See the inside the dome the last point the highest point is the critical point. After that there is no other entry because we will be reaching a zone where there is no distinction between liquid water and water vapor. So this is the superheated tables we have temp we have for a given pressure we have at a different temperatures we have all the properties u v h s yes, uh, given in this uh, tables similarly we have the subcooled tables listed at the last of this steam table so these are the different uh, um, things that you can read from a steam table we have uh, several other things also and as I explained in this problem, you can see uh, the two independent properties are given and you are asked to find the rest. Similarly, in this problem also, you have two independent properties, you will be asked to find the other properties. You will have different kinds of problems, uh, more elaborate, more practical coordinated problems which we will see in the later class. Thank you very much.